This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jose Vargas. He comes to us from Costa Rica, where he studied at the University of Costa Rica. He contacted me about six years ago, and after a number of communications, he was admitted, and here he is. Um, I asked Jose to work on a number of virus projects. I should press, uh, preface that by saying he he's wanted to come here to pursue interests in virology and bioinformatics. So uh, he worked on a number of virus systems. I asked him to set up a uh, system to allow us to use large-scale sequencing technologies for diagnostics. Um, he has done that over the last few years. Additionally, he's making use of the same technologies to address some questions regarding the host response, the small RNA response to virus infection. And today he'll be talking about um, the bioinformatic efforts he's made to set, uh, analyze networks of small RNAs. Uh, in the interest of time, he will not be discussing much about the virology per se, but uh, the best is still to come. So with that as an introduction, Jose. Thank you, Keith. Uh, can anyone hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to tell you about what I've been doing <coughs> for the last five years or so. So, as Keith mentioned, I've sort of been involved in two different lines of research. On the one hand, we've been looking, uh, we've been conducting projects that involve virus and viroid detection and characterization. And this involves all the published work so far. And even though it's taken some time, I only have one slide to show for today, uh, which is a summary of what we published. Uh, you can see here we've been working on spinach latent virus of tomato. We've also worked on two virus, uh, grapevine virus, grapevine virus E and grapevine asteroid mosaic associated virus, and also one viroid in grapevine. Uh, and that's it for virology. Now I'm going to move to my main thesis project. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, where we are focusing on a question. Uh, this is the question we're focusing on. What is the role of small RNA-mediated regulatory networks in host virus interactions? So just to get it out there, I'm going to show you my objectives. They may not make full sense right now, but hopefully through the interaction, uh, through the interaction they will. I just want you to know where I'm going. So I have two objectives. What I want to do is to identify and describe biologically relevant small RNA-mediated regulatory networks, and once I have them, to determine the regulatory contribution of the resulting networks. Now, going back to my main questions, there are three themes uh, here that I'd like to address. Small RNAs, networks, and host virus interactions. And I'll start with the interactions. So when you think about a virus, some may think about this. But this is a, can you see it? Yeah. This is actually a virion. A virion is an infectious particle. A virus is better thought of as an infected cell, where you have a whole complement of proteins that are not present in the virion, but are required for, uh, to complete the virus uh, replication cycle. So the viruses, as you know, they hijack the cell metabolism. Therefore, they interact at many levels with their host. Today, I'm going to be focusing in a series of interactions involved in immune responses. So in this diagram here, I'm showing the virus uh, replication cycle from virus entry, genome decapsidation, viral replication, and synthesis of viral proteins. And on the left, I'm showing a diagram that is familiar to most people here, where uh, Viral products can be recognized by pattern recognition receptors. In the case of plant viruses, they will be intracellular. And they can trigger a PTI-based response. As expected, virals encode effectors that can block the PTI response. And consequently, the host has evolved resistance genes that can recognize these viral proteins and trigger an ETI response. This is quite common. A theme in pathology. Now, in viruses, there's also what we think something we think of as adaptive immunity, where viral products can be recognized by host protein to launch an adaptive immune response, 
that is affected by RNAi or RNA interference. Now, so the main takeaway here is that RNA interference is involved in antiviral defense. And just as, as a reminder, RNA interference, RNAi, or RNA silencing refers to multiple biogenesis pathways that I've shown here in boxes that lead to the production of small RNAs, which are uh, molecules of 21 to 24 nucleotides long that are involved in transcriptional, translational, or post-transcriptional regulation. And they're quite important. They've been, even, people like to call them master regulators, and their activity has been described in multiple cellular systems and in, in multiple cellular processes in various systems. Here I'm showing examples where microRNAs are referred to as master regulators in humans, plants, and drosophila, so white flies. And in these systems, they've been related to regulation in, in cancer development. For our cases, plant defense response is quite important, and also genome stability. Now, small RNAs are also been discovered in plants to act through regulatory networks. Again, I'm showing here several examples that show small RNA networks involved in uh, development, trait dominance, and overall gene expression. So hopefully at this point I've convinced you that these small RNAs are quite important uh, regulators and that they collectively form regulatory networks involved in multiple processes like defense, development, stress. Now, if we go back to this plot, I would like to point uh, this uh, set of proteins here that are known as viral silencing suppressors. So these are proteins encoded in the virus that are able to block RNAi or RNA interference. So when you think, when you remember, uh, I just sort of went through the relevance of RNA interference for regular cell metabolism and viruses interference could have a great effect. And in fact, I don't have the time today to tell you mechanistically how this occurs, but the cytosine su suppressors can act by interfering with the small RNA biogenesis. They can also sequester these molecules, making them unavailable for their action. And they can also interfere with the proteins involved in the pathway. Now, do remember that the pathways involved in antiviral defense, defense and regular cell metabolisms uh, have a lot of common factors. So this viral interference could have a great effect on the plant. And we, I'm gonna show one example here where I'm showing Arabidopsis plants expressing, well, transgenically expressing different uh, viral silencing suppressors from different viruses. So on the left, this is how a healthy plant would look. And these are not virus-infected plants. They're only expressing these viral suppressor proteins. And you can see that the effect is quite dramatic. So something that could be of interest is that silencing suppressors are not exclusive to viruses. There are also known examples in bacterial pathogens. Uh, Pseudomonas syringae is a well-studied model where we've, some of the proteins have been described or involved in a uh, silencing suppressor. Also, there's an onomycid pathogen, Phytophthora soji, that encodes what appears to be multiple silencing suppressors. So this convergence appears to indicate that the small RNA silencing could be a, play a very relevant role in plant defense. Now, with this in mind, and thinking that small RNAs are master regulators of defense, and that they've work through regulatory networks, we developed these main research questions. Number one, what is the role of small RNA-mediated networks in immunity for our purposes, uh, viral infection? And given the existence of these common factors between small RNA biogenesis and defense, uh, we also have the next question, which is, what is the effect of viral silencing suppressors in host small RNA-mediated regulatory networks? Now, to study this, our model is cucumber mosaic virus, or CMV. Here I'm showing a diagram of its genome. There's three RNAs. And over here, the ORF2B corresponds to the protein that is involved in, that has silencing suppressor activity. So we've developed a couple of mutants for this protein, and we infected the Arabidopsis thaliana plants. So here I'm showing the phenotypes 
after three weeks, uh, well, three weeks post inoculation, on the top we have the mock plant, so this should be uninfected. Second name corresponds to plants infected with a wild type version of CMV. And then the two uh, lower panels corresponds to plants infected with the mutated version of this virus. And you can see they're pretty much asymptomatic. Now, in case you were wondering, we do know that the virus is replicating because we can detect the code protein in all plants. And just as a control, we do not detect the silence suppressor protein in our mutants as expected. Now, this is our experimental system. Uh, now, let's just, I'm gonna go back and review what we know about small RNA regulatory networks in a bit more detail. And just to get our terms right, a network is a set of nodes connected by a set of edges. In here, I'm showing the nodes in blue, which for my presentation corresponds to RNAs, it can be small RNAs or transcripts, and the green corresponds to the edges. That, in my case, corresponds to the interaction between the nodes. I've already shown that they're involved in multiple processes. And now most of these networks are composed by pairs of microRNA and phase small RNA interfering RNAs. Now, what do I mean by that? Here I'm showing the biogenesis pathway for microRNAs. So they are expressed from a gene. The transcript is then processed by dicer like proteins into small RNAs that are then sorted and loaded into agocom containing complexes, and these complexes are the effector molecules that will lead to mRNA degradation or translation or repression. Now, in some cases, there's a different outcome. The microRNA will target a transcript, and instead of leaving, leading to cleavage, it leads to the production of double-stranded RNA that is then cleaved by dicer-like proteins to produce phase small RNAs. Now, it's not really evident in the diagram here, but the name phase small RNAs refers to the fact that these double-stranded RNAs are cleaved sequentially by these dicer proteins to produce small RNAs in tandem that are 21 nucleotides long. Now, these small RNAs are also loaded into agro-containing complexes that can then have an effect, a regulatory effect on their targets. Now, I'm going to translate this diagram into a network view, and again, here we have the microRNAs. They can target transcripts, lead to degradation. Sometimes they will lead to the production of phase small RNAs or fast RNAs. And this, some have no activity. Some can uh, target other transcripts. Some can even target its own transcript or lead to the secondary production of small RNAs. So this creates a cascade effect uh, where the amount of information carried for the initial molecule grows very quickly. Now, again, to go back to the terms, in this case, my molecules here correspond to the nodes, and the edges are the interactions between these molecules. Now, back to the review. We have a very well-studied example in a cascade that initiates with microRNA uh, 173 and uh, small RNAs that derive from it, which uh, and I'm gonna go through in some detail because I'm gonna use it as an example and control later on. So if you have heard of it, if you know it, MIR-173 was described about 10 years ago, and it leads to this cascade of TASI RNAs. TASI RNAs refers to transacting small interfering RNAs, which was just the first class of phase small interfering RNAs. So TASI is a subset of FASI RNAs, just in case it can be confusing. Now in this diagram, what I'm showing is transcripts in blue ovals and small RNAs in orange rectangles. So there's an initial transcript that gives rise to a mature microRNA, targets the TAS2 transcripts to produce in this case, there are actually several small RNAs. I'm just showing one that is of particular interest because it targets another gene, but it also leads to the production of secondary uh, RNAs that can then go on and target other transcripts. This is an example of how this cascade effect would work. Now, over the years, this cascade has been growing, and this could represent uh, one of the more recent views of how this may work. 
Now, I'm showing the similar structure. So we have a microRNA here in the middle that targets, in this case, four loci, which are in the middle of these clusters, that produce fast RNAs, which are the little balls around each cluster. Now, this was a very nice study because they were able to link uh, this regulatory cascade to metabolic stress, uh, which provide functionality for it. Uh, now, I must say that their analysis is restricted to a known class of microRNAs and classes. So we knew about these interactions. They just expanded on them. And then they performed bioinformatic target prediction for all these small RNAs and performed target validation on a few selected targets of interest. So they're not doing a whole genome-wide study. They're just looking at a particular cascade of interest. Now, there is one precedent of a genome-wide view of regulatory networks by small RNAs, which was performed by David Balcom's group around 2010, uh, where they are looking uh, from a genome-wide perspective. And they provided the initial description of small RNA-mediated networks. Uh, they did some structural analysis. They were thinking about it from a network's point of view. And it's a really nice paper which reflects the overall potential of these regulatory networks. But we can't really assess the biological significance of it because they did not account for different types of small RNAs. And the fact that most of them that you find in the library are not active, and they did not do any validation for their edges. It's all a bioinformatic or in situ prediction. So with this in mind, and going back to my main question of what is the role of small RNA mediated networks in immunity, uh, when thinking about how to conduct this project and what we need, I came up with a set of requirements uh, for the networks that we would use or a reference frame to study that should be biologically relevant, it should be experimental support for it, should be reproducible, reproducible. And when going down the list and thinking about what's known so far, we realize we don't have an appropriate framework to do this comparison. So unfortunately, we don't have enough information to address this question. And at this point, we decided, well, we could try something else or we can do it ourselves. So, Coming up with this reference frame to study small RNA regulation became a main thesis project, which was to produce a model network of small RNA interactions. Now, <clears throat> admittedly, I did not have a background in programming or computational biology at the time, but it was a pretty smooth process. <laughs> I don't know why people complain a lot. It was mostly inconsequential. It, it seemed to just go right. There was no problem to it. So. <laughs> Uh, I'll go back to my objectives. As, as, as Keith mentioned, my objectives will reflect the fact that uh, the part with virology, it's over at this point of the presentation. If you were hoping to hear more about viruses, uh, please wait until the next time. Because by now, I'm going to focus on the networks. And mostly, I'm going to focus on identifying and describing biologically relevant small RNA-mediated networks and determining their regulatory contribution. Then again, this is to provide a reference frame so that we can go back to study the effect of virus in these systems. Now, I'm going to first describe the approach I took to identify the small RNA-mediated networks. So, step one is to produce a model network for Arabidopsis thaliana. Uh, the model network would, ident would involve identifying all nodes and, known and all edges. And once we have this, we basically have a map of all possible interactions using this reference frame. We can then input exp expression data to produce sample or treatment-specific networks. Uh, so that's the plan. Now, to do this, if I go back to my diagram of components, because we're working at Avidopsis Taliana, we know a lot, or there's a lot of background information. So the latest annotation of our Avidopsis genome is named Araport 11, and it was produced in 2016, last year. And from here, we can get all known microRNAs and target transcripts. It's a pretty good full annotation. And for the rest of the molecules, I had to come up with a bioinformatics tool and uh, a few data sets to uh, get all this information. I'll get into the details of the data sets in a minute. 
Now, that is for phase one. For phase two, then we need, uh, which phase two is a quantification part, we will use small RNA-seq and RNA-seq to count or provide a, quanti a quantitative side to it. Now, for data acquisition, if you remember, I need uh, three types of data. I'm trying to get small RNAs, which are produced by small RNA-seq, RNA-seq to get uh, all the transcripts information. I'll describe Degradon data sets in a minute. Now, to obtain all these molecules or these data sets, we, uh, as I mentioned before, we have an experiment with Arabidopsis thaliana from which we get total RNA, and from that total RNA sample, we produce these three data sets. Now, hopefully, the first two are familiar. I'll take a minute to describe Degradon library because it's actually quite important for the purposes of this presentation. So Degradon library or Degradon data is what we use to validate our edges, which are the interactions between small RNAs and transcripts. And it's a two-step process. We first do a prediction of all the cleavage sites. Now here I'm illustrated a messenger RNA. We find regions where small RNAs can target and use, because we know how they act, we can predict how a cleavage transcript would look. Then we move on to experimental validation, where using uh, molecular methods, we clone and sequence all degraded RNAs. And then we look for accumulation of five prime terminal tags of these sequences at the predicted cleavage site, which basically means we look at our sequencing data and determine if we can find molecules that would fit our prediction. Now, the validation process or how we examine these results is a, I don't really have time to describe it in full, but it's a process, it's a quantitative assessment that involves uh, statistical modeling. So the take home message is that we have experimental validation for all of the edges and interactions in the networks that I'm gonna present. Uh, and also we do this so we can, so that the network has that we can do biologically relevant inferences from our networks. Now, just to remind you, because this is gonna be important and I'm gonna go back and forth between these terms. When I talk about degradom data, I'm talking about experimental validation of small RNA cleavage of a transcript, which in our networks corresponds to the edges. Now, just a quick comment about the data acquisition. Uh, we make our own libraries in the lab in case someone is interested in this. Uh, for RNA-seq, it's the only one where we use a kit, but we still make them in the lab. And the other two data sets are produced by somehow hybrid methodologies from Gene Giovannoni's lab and our publications that we've adapted to our own lab. Now, for the bioinformatics tool. When I was thinking about how to present this, uh, I was reminded about this Italian researcher that gave a seminar in the plant biology seminar, seminar series a couple of weeks ago. And she had a great comment, and I quote, she said that when describing your bioinformatic pipelines to your colleagues, it's like showing pictures of your kids to your friends. No one cares. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you want to show them every detail and you think you're writing a symphony, uh, it's just, I don't know. I think someone may care, and if you do, I'm happy to tell you about it. But I'm just going to summarize my tool in one slide. Uh, I made this bioinformatic pipeline or tool that has several modules that are made to find all the nodes in my networks and I'm making use of existing tools. I've also modified some of them and I created my own. And the same strategy for the edges. So then my tool brings all the nodes and edges together to produce my small RNA regulatory networks. So that wasn't too painful, I hope. Now, uh, another reminder. When uh, looking for all, analyzing my data and trying to identify all the components in my networks, remember I'm trying to produce a model network, which involves all nodes, all small RNAs and transcripts and all edges. In this process, I realized that the identification is data intensive. And most importantly, uh, the identification depends on expression. And the expression of these small RNAs uh, could depend on developmental stages, the tissue type you use to make your collection, or environmental cues, such as stress. So to account for this, I produced my own data sets and also went back to databases. So this is a summary of the data I use. 
for small RNA libraries, I made 14 small RNA libraries from Arabidopsis plants that were infected or not with CMV. And also, I got 38 data sets available at the NCBI database that corresponds to what type of Arabidopsis plants. Uh, and this was very useful because it's Arabidopsis, there's a lot of background information, and I was able to find uh, data sets corresponding to just wild type healthy plants, also hormone treated plants. I've shown an example of metabolic stress. I've also have uh, libraries from different tissue sources and also plants that have been challenged by pathogens, including viruses and nematodes. Now for the Degradome libraries, I had the same strategy. Oh, I produced 16 data sets. Uh, but there are only five available at NCVI, and they correspond to inflorescence and seedling tissue. Now, okay, so that is the setup. Let's take a look at the results. Uh, just to remind you, I'm trying to identify these networks, or small RNA regulatory networks. And from my diagram, the missing components are the fasci loci that corresponds to the transcripts that produce fancy RNAs, which are the other missing part. So uh, the identification of these components is performed using a small RNA uh, information. And this is a summary of all the libraries that I use. So in the X axis is the name of the library, the identificator for the library. The set on the left corresponds to this study or the ones I produce. Oh, and the Y axis corresponds to millions of reads. Uh, then in black, I'm showing the total yield of the sequencing project when available. In blue, I'm showing the amount of all the reads that are actually usable or pass filtered. And what I'm trying to communicate here is that the libraries are varied, right? Some are really good, some are not. They're hard to evaluate. Uh, so we take that into account in our analysis. Now, to find those fancy loci, which is the first step, I took each library and tried to identify these regions using an existing tool called Face Tank. And the idea is that I identified all the regions in all the, my libraries, and then I summarized the results to produce a consensus fuzzy locus. And these are the results again. So here, what I'm showing is fuzzy loci detection, so regions that produce phase small RNAs. Libraries are on the X axis. And on the y-axis is the number of detection events. So how many fancy loci I detect per library. And you can see, again, the results are varied. And actually, our libraries were pretty good for detecting uh, fancy loci. You can see some just provided no results at all. Now, the next step is to produce a consensus loci. So here is a summary which basically represents repeatability. How many times a region is found to be a producer of fancy RNAs across libraries. I found 92 regions represented here on the x-axis. In the y-axis is the number of times that region is recognized across libraries. And you can see that most of them, or a good amount of them, are found multiple times. But some are found in a very few occasions, even just one time or in, one, in a single library. And this could represent false positives, or they could also just uh, represent regions that are expressed only under a particular circumstance. Now, if you remember in my diagram, fancy loci are the regions that produce phase small RNAs, and we can test the activity of the small RNAs using degradome data. So I use this to validate this previous set of results by asking the question, do the small RNAs that derive from this loci have uh, biological activity assessed by degradome data. And now I have this reduced subset of 50 regions from which I have, from which small RNAs, or small RNAs derived from them actually have validated targets. And if you're wondering where are they or what they are, most of them correspond to annotated regions in the genome that uh, correspond to coding genes. And for our purposes, they're of great interest because a lot of uh, defense-related genes are known to produce small RNAs. So the most evident example is MBLLR proteins, 
that we know their transcripts uh, can produce phase small interfering RNAs. And actually, this is why I was mentioning before that they're known as massive regulators of plant defense. Now, going back to our diagram. So we have the consensus uh, locus. We mapped the small RNAs. And now we need to find the triggers. And just a quick reminder about what a trigger is. A trigger will represent a small RNA that starts this process of double-stranded RNA production and subsequent cleavage. Now, in this diagram, I must say this is not entirely accurate. And very quickly, I will show you a few interesting features about small RNA or fatty RNA biogenesis that are usually not accounted for. So going back to my MIR-173 example, we know it targets the TAS1 transcript, leads to the production of small RNAs, and this would be the expected result. The microRNA sets the register for the cleavage, the sequential cleavage. Now, this, most models are based on 21 nucleotide long uh, phase small interfering RNAs. I don't have time to show you the evidence, but we know there are actually also 22 nucleotide long small RNAs. And if you think about it, this is relevant because if you change the size for one of these molecules, then everything gets shifted over. And another important feature is that per transcript, there can be multiple triggers, as I'm showing here. And those triggers can actually set up different registers from which new small RNAs can arise. And these small RNAs can have possible new targets and therefore new activities. And it overall represents an unexplored expanded regulatory capacity for, this, uh, for each of these locus. So then, going back to my process, um, I'm trying to find the triggers that set up the production of phase small interfering RNAs. And this is a summary. For 74% of all my transcripts, I was able to find a trigger. Uh, there's 36% for which I couldn't identify any. And you can see here, in some cases, I was able to find out down to three triggers per transcript. Now, having this trigger information, and just to remind you, the relevance of the triggers is that they can set up different registers from which new RNAs can arise. We can now collect all the small RNAs that derive from the different register and different sizes that I mentioned, pull, make a big pool, including microRNAs, and use our Degerlum data to confirm them. So here, I'm showing a brief summary of the Degerlum data. In red, this is what was uh, what exists in the NCVI data, uh, <coughs> database. In black, I'm showing our contribution. So we made 16 extra libraries, which can be summarized here, where for this analysis, 89% of all the information or all the Degradam data used corresponds to our libraries. And if you remember, this is what we use to validate the interactions between small RNAs and transcripts. So when we do that for our big pool of small RNAs, we get these results. We know we have two classes of small RNAs, microRNAs, which I'm using a known set, as was described in the latest annotation of Arabidopsis. We know there's 427 microRNAs reported. I was able to find activity or confirm activity for 223, which corresponds to the most comprehensive analysis of small RNA or microRNA activity in Arabidopsis using Degradom data. Now, this is where the, my main contribution, or the main contribution of my tool is in finding all these fancy RNAs, and in particular, the ones that are active, which I'm showing here in red. Now, I'm going to focus on this active set of fancy RNAs and break them down into four groups. The first group corresponds to 21 phase small RNAs, <coughs> which kind of correspond to this blue set here. And this corresponds to the small RNAs that most available tools uh, would find, which are about 350. But then there's about 250 of these active small RNAs that are in a different register that my tool is able to pick up. Additionally, there's also about 150, which are 22 nucleotides long, that unless most tools will not pick up unless you do a combined search. And there's a subset uh, where 
they're both 22 and in a different register. Now, again, to summarize this, what I'm saying is that using this approach, we were able to double the number of small RNAs of known activity. Therefore, we expanded on the regulatory capacity we can recover. Now, we've gone through pretty much all the motions. All we have to do now is remove all non-active small RNAs and attach it all together to produce a model network. And four years later, this is my small RNA regulatory network. <laughs> this is what I was been working for. Now, uh, a quick reminder. I am using Degradom data for this. I know I keep saying it, but so the interactions, all the edges have experimental support. <laughs> but even so, I think whenever, at least whenever I'm confronted to something like this, a few questions arise. Is it real? Right? Hopefully I convince you that it is because I'm using experimental or each interaction is experimentally validated. Does it reflect biology? I'll try to evaluate that. And most importantly, uh, you may have noticed I don't have sufficient jokes for the length of this seminar. So if you have any suggestion and you're getting bored by now, uh, I really would need, I don't know any network jokes. But now, no, uh, stay there. We think about it so far, what I've been showing is all the steps that lead to the production of the networks. So we're just building to this moment, and now I get this is the fun part. And it just, I only have a few more things to say. Now, just a quick reminder. The objectives were to describe and identify and describe biologically relevant small RNA-mediated networks. Now, to show that they are actually valid, I'm going to sort of go into that network to our old friend, MIR-173, which I've said before, we know a lot about it. And if my network construction is correct, I should be able to reconstruct what we know about MIR-173. So I'm gonna use this cascade for evaluation. Quick reminder, I'm also using this because it's a tricky one. There's a lot of nuances. We know it targets uh, the task transcripts. For this transcript in a specific, there's three triggers. We know there's phase changes, so there's a lot of things going on. And this would be the most challenging example. And just to guide you, we have a microRNA. We have four fuzzy loci in the middle of these clusters. The balls around it corresponds to sets of small RNAs that derive from it. We know it would target, they're predicted to target PPR proteins, which are proteins involved in defense. And there's also a function for this, uh, which has been shown to be involved in metabolic stress. So I'll try to recreate that. So I go to my network. I tried to get the MIR-173 subnetwork represented here or highlighted in red. And I'll change the view to something more simple. So just to reconstruct it, we have one microRNA, we have four transcripts, and a set of loci. So, so far, so good. Now I'm going to show, oh, so here they did bioinformatic predictions of targets, right? I've been saying how I do experimental validation of targets. So now I'm going to change the view and show you the results for this with my tool. And there's a couple of things to mention here. The change of colors, the blue ones, the new ones, are all these small RNAs that are different sizes or in a different register. So they're here to illustrate the contribution of including all these different nuances into an analysis tool. And on the bottom, I'm showing all the RNA transcript targets. And here, hopefully you can see it, I'm showing the PPR proteins that they predicted and validated to be targets. So we can reconstruct uh, the network with the right topology. We have the right molecules. Now they have a function. They know it is involved in metabolic stress. So I took all the genes that are targeted by this cascade and did a functional enrichment analysis using Go terms. So I'm going to use several of these uh, plots, so let me walk you through it. In this case, the size of the circle corresponds to the breadth of the category. So for example, biological process is a much bigger category than transport. Then white means non-significant enrichment. Everything in color refers to significantly enriched categories. And the darker, the more significant the results. Now, before you go through it, I'm just going to direct you to this side over here, which corresponds to categories involved in defense response more importantly, to abiotic stress stimulus. So what I'm showing here is that using my approach and go rich uh, functional enrichment, 
we could make functionally valid inferences from our network. I was able to reconstruct or validate my network because we have the right topology, we have the right molecules, and we could even predict the right functions using this approach summarized here. So again, we have accurate identification of the components. We have accurate reconstruction of the network topology. We can make functional inferences that are consistent with experimental results. I've shown how we can expand on the regulatory capacity. And just to remind you, we use an unbiased genome-wide approach, right? We're not focusing on a particular set, so we can do that type of analysis across the genome. Now, I'm gonna move very quickly to a description of the network. Uh, and I'm gonna change the view. We know it has this type of structure that I think is easier to read, so I'm gonna change the view to this. And let me walk you through this rearrangement of the network. We can start here. These are the pre-microRNAs. These are transcripts that get processed to produce microRNAs. So here, I'm showing a set of microRNAs that do not induce fast RNA production. To the right, I'm showing the microRNAs that do trigger Fast RNA production from this fast loci. I said that the, produ the produced fast loci can, in turn, trigger secondary production of small RNAs from other uh, transcripts shown here and the resulting fast RNAs. And also, if you remember, I said I had a set for which I have no, tar no trigger. So this corresponds to all the fast producing regions that do not, for which I have no target. And at the bottom are all the target transcripts for each set. Now, if you were wondering what kind of genes are involved in this network, again, I did a functional enrichment analysis. And also before we go through all the categories, I can summarize this in a simple statement. Most categories are represented in this network. And actually this result uh, triggered another question that I thought it was, I think is pretty interesting which instead of looking for categories that are enriched because everything is there, one can think of what is not there. So we did, we did analysis for functional underrepresentation, and there's only one category that is underrepresented in my network that corresponds to genes involved in translational regulation. And actually, I don't have a hypothesis for this. I think it's very interesting, but I don't know. I have no way to explain it at the moment. If anyone has any idea, I'll be happy to hear your thoughts. So we have performed other uh, structural analysis on the networks that I don't have the time to discuss today, but if you're interested, I'm happy to tell you about it. Now I'm just gonna move on to the second objective, which involves determining the regulatory contribution of the network. So this is a summary of the network components. I've gone through most of them uh, before. I just wanna stress the fact that my network includes about 20% of all known Arabidopsis genes, which should be indicative of the overall potential. But when you think about it, it's not only the regulatory potential of this network, it's not only, the, not only involved the genes that are there, but also their activities. An example would be, if my networks involve regulation of a transcription factor, the transcription factor uh, activity would play into this. So that's the first thing we did. We start asking what kind of genes are here. And we first look for transcription factors. And here I'm highlighting in red all the transcription factors found in our networks. The summary is that there's 26% of all transcription factors are under small RNA regulation according to our model. We can broaden this search by just trying to search all genes involved in regulation, and this is our results. About 30% of all genes that have been involved or have been shown to be involved in transcription regulation are under small RNA control. So in summary, uh, when it comes to the contribution or the regulatory contribution of my network, there's 25% of all described genes, most functional categories are represented, and about 39, about 30% 30 of all genes involved in transcription or regulation appear to be under small RNA control. Now, you might be wondering, how can we use this met regulatory meta network? If you remember, I used this, I used a composite data set to produce this. 
And one example that may refer to plant pathology is you can ask the same question I was doing before, but for defense response genes. So again, if we look for all the genes that have a uh, function related to defense, 30% are under small RNA regulation. So an example here could be if you have your system where your pathogen is disrupting the regulation or yeah, the regulation of your favorite host gene, either upregulated or downregulated, and you want to understand the mechanism by which this is happening, you can use this model to ask first, is your gene under small RNA regulation? And if it is, where in the network is it? How many small RNAs are targeting it? So there's some useful information you can get from it. Uh, but there's also, I want to show very quickly, and this is the last part of my talk, I want to show how I want to do it. So back to my plan, first was to produce a model network, which I've done. Then step two involves having expression data to produce now sample specific networks. So moving from a meta network to something that corresponds to a plant or a sample or a treatment. So I'm gonna show, this is based on preliminary data. And I'm gonna use an, an example using an uninfected plant. So if you remember, I have RNAs and a small RNA data set from all my uh, samples. Here is a summary of an uh, RNA-seq experiment where on the x-axis I have all the expressed genes. There are about 17,000 in my libraries. And on the y-axis I'm showing the expressions, the expression level as the log of the normalized count. So there's just a lot of libraries, but each one of these corresponds to a specific gene. This would be the section of low expression genes, this would correspond to high express genes. Now from a network, we know which ones are under small RNA control, which I'm gonna highlight here in red. So about 35% of all the genes have the potential to be regulated by small RNAs. Now, if you remember these interactions, make sense if both molecules are expressed. You need the small RNA and the transcript for regulation to occur. So I'm not gonna show it, but I did the same analysis for small RNAs. And then I can take all that data and input it into my model network. So here I'm highlighting in red all the nodes that show expression in an uninfected sample. You can't really see the black dots because the network is, is so dense, but those will correspond to the non-expressed genes. And now I'm going to take away everything that is not expressed in this particular sample. And this is what you're left with. So you're going to notice here there's a bunch of free nodes this corresponds to transcripts for which the small RNA is not present or vice versa. So there will be no regulatory contribution here, but if you look, there's still some edges. So all the edges that are still exist in this network corresponds to instances in which the small RNA and the transcripts are detected as expressed in, my, in an uninfected sample. So again, I'm gonna change the view to something more friendly. Here is a meta network. Here is the network corresponding to my uninfected sample. So as expected, it corresponds to a much smaller subset of all the nodes and interactions, but these ones would be the ones that are relevant. So with this example, I hope that you can imagine how we can use this to evaluate virus infection, virus effect on regulation. So our plan is to produce this type of sample specific networks and then start asking, what are the changes? Are there structural changes? Uh, and also, I'm showing this as an on and off state, but there also there's a quantitative side to this. So you can also query or ask what kind of genes are undergoing uh, expression differences or differential gene expression and where do they fit in these networks and how viruses can affect this uh, small RNA regulatory contribution. So, my conclusions, so you can take a breath now. I think I'll finish <laughs> with this. Uh, I just wanna say that for my thesis project and this, proce uh, this project, what I did was to construct a model network of a small RNA regulatory global regulation. I confirmed the accuracy of my approach and illustrated how it expands on previous reports. I validated the regulatory potential of small RNA mediated networks. This is basically going back to those big claims about small RNA being master regulators of gene expression. Now we have data to support that claim, and I think it's true. 
uh, I developed a bioinformatics tool that it can be used for other species, given some requirements. Uh, the tool can be thought of as a hungry tool. Uh, this means that the more data becomes available, we can add that data and update our model to get better resolution. The tool is not publicly available yet, and we're not sure whether we're going to pursue a publication for it. But if you're interested, we can apply it to other systems. And most importantly, we finally develop a model system that can be used to study the role of small RNAs in viral pathogenesis, or your favorite topic, actually. So for future directions, I think it should be clear that what we want to do is use this resulting model to determine the role of small RNA-mediated <coughs> networks in viral pathogenesis. Basically, and also, what is the effect of viral silencing suppressors in host small RNA-mediated networks, which will involve asking what is the role of small RNAs in this phenotype development. <laughs> and I would just like to finish with acknowledgments. I especially want to thank Keith uh, for sticking up with me for five years. It's been a great time. I really enjoyed the lab. I particularly enjoyed the opportunity of pursuing a project of my design and interest. This, this seemed far-fetched at the beginning, but uh, I, it was a great experience. I'd also like to thank all the my committee members for their <coughs> advice and support, uh, Mark Fuchs, Dr. Fay, and Chris Myers. I especially want to thank my lab members. So Jeremy is not here today, but he's been a great person to have in the lab. He knows a lot of it. Um, he knows a lot, and he's very useful. Uh, Heather, a lab technician, also thank you for the support and for keeping us honest in the lab. Uh, there's been a set of series of undergrads that have helped in different projects. I'd also like to thank uh, Andrew Grimson and Stephanie Watson, which is uh, undergrad in, uh, a grad student in Andrew Grimson's lab that helped us during the development of small RNA libraries. And also Julia Brevatov and Jun Ru and Jin Giovannoni's lab that assisted us in developing or establishing the library making technologies. And finally, there's also uh, funding sources for this work. Most of these were involved in the set of virus-related projects that I described at the beginning. And my networks project was been partly funded by CATS. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and take your questions. Questions? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering how you take all of these different data sets and put them all together in a network in a way that to me it would seem like to be completely sure that you have the pathway correct. I think when you put it in your network, you'd have to see all of those parts in the same sample. So like if for one sample, for one a uh, tissue sample, you would have an sRNA library, an RNA-seq library, and a Degredome library, and make sure that you see all of the parts that you need to see. When you use this larger set of libraries, how does that, are you taking that into account? Or how are you dealing with that to make sure that all of the parts are in the right place at the right time? Okay. Um, let's see, let me see if I understand. Just to recapitulate, the question is, how do I know that my method network is representative of a network that would occur in a single sample? Yeah, because what I'm thinking is if, if you identify, if you have a degradome sample from Arabidopsis roots and you find the cleavage, but your microRNA and the small RNAs are in shoots, it's not really relevant. Right. And so this would... I'll go back to this figure here. Yeah, so, or actually maybe this one here. If for this regulatory, for the regulatory effect to occur, you need the small RNA and the transcript to be present at the same time. And here, all the free nodes, so this is a network for an uninfected sample. So it represents one treatment and it actually represents a tissue. So we're dealing with tissue averages. <laughs> All the free nodes 
in this network corresponds to instances in which one of the two in the pair is not present. So if we don't see expression, we don't make a connection when we evaluate it uh, in a single library, right? Now, another thing you can consider is they also have to be present in the same cell or something like that. But, well, actually, that's not entirely true. They're not cell autonomous, so they can move around. I think that using the approach of tissue averages is okay. Now, even if we have both nodes expressed in, a, in the same tissue library, we don't know, well, actually, I'm not trying to evaluate cleavage per library. I'm evaluating expression. And the way we're gonna use this is in a comparative form. So if I produce this type of network in an uninfected and infected sample, I can see how uh, the dynamics change. So I can see, I would be able to see if a microRNA expression goes up and its target correspondingly goes down, this would correspond, <laughs> that would correspond to <laughs> meaningful interactions. So I mostly, most of the downstream analysis would be based on that, on looking at the dynamics of each pair upon different treatments. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just thinking about when you build the reference network. Oh, right. So the reference network is just a map of interactions. And they don't necessarily exist in any given plant. And sometimes they may never be present. So one could think that some of these nodes never occur. But this is showing the overall regulatory potential. When we look at expression, then we see uh, which ones are active and which ones are not. The, the issue is that we, when we started, we were planning to do a network per treatment. And we realized that the results are not comparable. We need a model network because if you have a fuzzy loser that is on, it has very, very low expression, you may not detect it at all. So our aim was to get all the map, all the interactions mapped, and then input expression data to do it. So, so I'm just wondering whether, uh, whether there is any difference of the uh, the this selective mind production or the character between the virus infect, infected or uninfected. I, that, I, I mean that whether the virus CMV infection can cause the, some you know difference between the the this selective mind production or the or the transcription transcription of the the face loose eye like that. Yeah, so this is a great question, and this is actually what we plan to do now, because if you think about a virus acting, so I mentioned that viruses encode silencing suppressors, and silencing suppressors will affect the production of small RNAs. So in a virus setting, you may be preventing the production of these microRNAs over here. If you block the production of microRNAs over here, you may lose all the downstream regulation, and that would be, I mean, this a lot of potential genes involved in this. Uh, so that's where we're heading. We don't have the data yet. We're working on that. But yeah, we want, really want to know how viruses will change this structure. And we know they can target each step. In the interest of time, I think I will ask you to thank Jose and anyone who's interested in discussing it further, please come up. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.